I'm Anthony, and on behalf of AdWorks, I would like to welcome you to uh, Ethereum Meetup Poland, uh, so end of summer edition. I think everyone is sad that the summer is over, but let's look at the bright side. Nice meetup, cool people, what could be best to uh, like dry off the tears. So, uh, first of all, who is the first time here? Hands up. Okay, uh, constant in, uh, influx of new people, that's good, that's good. Uh, so, we will have today two presentations. Um, after that, some networking. Don't feel shy, there is something to drink. There will be pizza later on, so please stay and talk with, uh, with, with each other because that's the main purpose of these uh, meet, meetups. Um, and I think we will just start with the first presentation. Um, please make some noise for Yevgeny. He's from Fluence, and he will try uh, to explain us how to do the normal thing, so data, data storage on decentralized systems. So just a moment, minute of a break, and we will start. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, I'm Evgeny from Fluence. I'm co-founder of Fluence, and uh, I'm going to talk to you today about what we are doing and uh, how we are building a decentralized data infrastructure. Uh, but uh, first, I would like to ask uh, how many of you are software developers or like building a software or like a technical? Okay. Okay, yeah, thank you, thank you. Like, so I think, I hope my presentation will be interesting for you. <laughs> uh, so I'd like to start with the um, quick summary of uh, today's internet. And uh, we all probably know that uh, current internet have has lots of problems with privacy, with monopolization, uh, infrastructure issues. And uh, if you're talking about privacy, for example, you probably heard about uh, a very big um, data breach last year, Equifax breach when about a half of US population personal and very sensitive data was stolen and went to black markets. Um, and uh, people in the US was very unhappy with that. Um, and um, another issue about Facebook and advertising person, like selling personal data to advertising companies uh, that was done by Cambridge Analytica. Um, also, uh, a very, very important thing and uh, such we see more and more such news every year. Um, and uh, if you're talking about privacy, another great example here is um, voice assistance. Now we have these devices that are being manufactured uh, by uh, big companies uh, already, like Google, Amazon, uh, and Apple has it. And uh, these devices basically uh, stay at your home, listen everything that happens there, and they can upload like er, er, each every recording to their private servers, and you don't have the like you you can't manage that, you can't stop them from from doing this, and this this is the 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 real problem. Another thing is centralization of infrastructure. For example, we have Amazon AWS that controls about 35 percent of um, web services infrastructure, about like cloud infrastructure, storage, processing, and so on. And uh, if they have some, some outages or problems with their infrastructure, we can literally feel it in our devices. We can literally feel how internet just stops. Uh, and uh, another thing, for example, is um, monopolization. Like, uh, I have this example on the slide. Uh, when Microsoft announced that they are buying GitHub, Many people were not happy with that because uh, now, actually, if you had the private repository on a GitHub, now it's access like it's Microsoft um, people from Microsoft, Microsoft employees, and and so on has access to your private repos, not direct, but they they can access it, and uh, many people not happy with that. Many repositories was moved to uh, analogies to GitLab and so on, so. It's kind of kind of issues, and uh, there is a model of a decentralized internet, uh, and uh, this like this 
the vision, the design that we will have uh, like because of because of blockchain, because of Ethereum, we will have lots of protocols blockchain powered. They will implement some part of internet in uh, in a new decentralized, more secure way with respect of data privacy and so on. So different projects doing different things. We have the new things like Ethereum or Polkadot that connects Bitcoin uh, that connects blockchains with messages and transactions. Um, and we have um, projects that trying to re like, uh, reinvent old things in a new way. We have uh, projects who focus on heavy computing or like off-chain, what we call off-chain computing like Golem or Truebit. Um, we have projects who focus on data processing or databases part like Fluence. And uh, we have projects that um, aim to provide decentralized file storage or CDNs. And uh, we all know probably about them. It's IPFS, Swarm, and a few others. And today, I'm going to focus on our part, what we are doing at Fluence. It's a decentralized data processing and um, databases. So traditionally, we know like the, this um, traditional applications architecture. We have a front end. We have a JavaScript that. Uh, executed in the browser, we have a backend, some code on the backend server, and this backend talks to a database where all the data is stored. And uh, probably you know these names, these guys are doing databases, and uh, these providers provide the infrastructure for, for backend. And uh, if you are talking about database part, um, like quick, quick brief, what is database? Database is actually a software that allow to access and query data in a very, very efficient way. And databases usually have a special index, special data structure that uh, allows to access data fast and efficient. And uh, the like, index is basically a catalog of entries that points to a particular entry if you want to find it by criteria, filter data, sort it, and so on. It, it, it allows you to do this because the data is organized in a special way in index. and this is very important when we are talking about uh, accessing data in real time. So, in and let's think a little bit uh, how would the decentralized like design of a decentralized application would look like if we have if we still have a front end and JavaScript in the browser, and now we have a theorem with the smart contracts with code that is yet being performed on a blockchain. So on each machine on the network, uh, do we actually need a database part? And uh, let's think about, a little bit about that. So can we use Ethereum just as a database? Can we store data in Ethereum? And the, the problem here is Ethereum is designed to be secure. And all the data that you put there by transactions, it's permanent. It's there forever. And that's why, uh, as a trade-off, it's really expensive. If you want to upload one gigabyte of data to Ethereum network, uh, it would cost you probably like about five millions of dollars in a few days, because you cannot just put it in a one transaction, one block. You have block limit, uh, the maximum size of the block, so you will have to do many, many transactions and many blocks to upload one gigabyte. And what about? Uh, next generation blockchains that today, like every day we see, we see new uh, high, th high throughput blockchain that, that being announced. Usually these solutions are focused on, uh, on, on increasing transactions per second. They, they are uh, most focused on performance of writing data on chain. And uh, but if you still need to put significant amount of data there, like 10 gigabytes or one terabyte and so on, it still will be expensive. And uh, another thing, they are not usually focused on accessing data, on reading data from, from a blockchain efficiently. Like doing a queries, doing a complex request by parameter, searching data through different parameters. And they usually do not focus on any latency guarantees or SLA. Because um, 
nodes usually have no incentivization uh, about uh, responding as quick as they can. And uh, here, let me just give you an example. Uh, imagine that we are doing the wallet application for Ethereum, and it would have some fancy uh, user interface with the balances, with some charts, with some analytics, and so on. And we would like to do a few things. We would need to um, display current token balances, maybe token like history of balances that we have, his history of token balances that we have in our wallet. Uh, we would like to calculate some average transaction cost um, and show it on, on a chart. And we would like to display some more complex analytics. Probably we are a user of CryptoKitties and we would like to see how many CryptoKitties is being created uh, each day. So it, it seems that it's, it's very simple. We need to connect our mobile, uh, mobile app of, of our wallet to Ethereum and just get balances from there. But in reality, we have to connect to a particular node on the Ethereum network and access data from, from this node. And if this node is just, uh, for example, it's malicious, uh, it can respond us anything when we ask for balances. So uh, we can just get some random numbers and we have no way to verify it. Uh, the only way to verify it is just connect to another node. And uh, this node is not incentivized to respond us as quick as it can. So we can just have poor user experience if we connect to, to, to some node and just ask for, um, for a data. And uh, it's become even worse if we need to uh, to retrieve some, like to get a re response for some complex query, to do some complex query, to um, draw a chart. Usually, uh, to solve this, and and the default Ethereum node interface usually just not provide such um, query query interface, query language that allow that would allow us to. Um, get this data, this kind of aggregated data. Uh, and uh, usually to solve this issue, we would uh, set up our own private server, put some traditional database there, for example, MySQL, put Ethereum data into this MySQL, build index, and using this index, we would be able to do, do such queries. But in this case, uh, our users will have to trust this server. And this application is not more so decentralized because now it relies on a centralized third-party servers that we just set up. So what would be better here? It would be cool to have a network uh, that has lots of nodes. And these nodes has the, have the uh, Ethereum data and indexes and we could access this data and do a queries on a query language that we like, either it SQL or GraphQL or any custom query language that we can create by ourselves. And these nodes would verify each other in and focus on real time performance. So that's actually what we are doing at Fluence. And uh, if we have such a network, we are not focused on just Ethereum data. We could connect uh, any other blockchains and build indexes for blockchain data. Or we can connect decentralized file storages and any other data sources can be indexed and data from them can, um, can be consumable, can, uh, consumable by applications. So, uh, and uh, how, how if, we, if you think about that, um, we would probably, to, to build such a network, we would probably will need to uh, have a balance in uh, this like decentralization trilemma. We cannot achieve at the same time security, real time, and cost efficiency. So let's just think what we can achieve here. If we put traditional clouds on this triangle, it probably will be 
uh, between real-time processing and cost efficiency. It's quite cheap, it works in real time, but it's not decentralized because you rely on one authority like Amazon or, or Microsoft or Google. And if you put Ethereum, for example, here, it's optimized for decentralization, it's, it's fully decentralized. It's kind of real time because we have block time, 20 seconds, it works like better than Bitcoin block time, for example. Um, it's not like just milliseconds. And it's probably not cost efficient because every transaction are being computed and repeated by each node on the network. So if you put just one byte of data, it will be uh, on the 1,000 of nodes. So it's not, not so efficient in terms of cost. And uh, if you look at the project like Truebit, they are doing off-chain computations for uh, Ethereum smart contracts with on-chain uh, dispute resolution. Uh, they are much more cost efficient because the same computation is being repeated just by a few nodes. It's still decentralized because any node can join the network and perform computation. But it's not real time because they rely on Ethereum block time. And uh, so where affluence would be on such a di diagram? Let's just come back to, to this uh, in a few slides. First of all, what is, what is fluence? Uh, Fluence provides infrastructure to access, query, and transform data from decentralized sor sources into highly efficient real-time APIs and data interfaces. So I hope you, you like it, this uh, description. Uh, so what, what, why Fluence is, is so good? Uh, it's still decentralized, so any node can join the network and leave network at any time. So it's fully permissionless. It's open. Uh, at the same time, it's cost efficient, so it, it, the cost of storing data and querying data using Fluence Network is still uh, near the, the uh, cloud uh, services. It focused on real-time performance, and uh, everything that happens on the network is auditable. So nodes on the network verify each request that they are doing, and every request that done on the network can be verified by any other uh, nodes that can connect to a network at any moment. So everything what happens on the network is publicly verifiable and auditable. And just a, just a quick uh, dig into um, our architecture. We, we are doing the, like we're splitting the, the network of, uh, the network work to, to two uh, things. We have real-time validation of queries that happens on the network and batch validation. Real-time validation, so we organize network to small, relatively small clusters of nodes. They are well connected. They have full copy of data and uh, the client just work directly with the clusters. And uh, each node in the cluster have a local uh, local copy of data, so it works with, with the local um, database version. They have, they connected with standard mean consensus uh, that provides uh, very fast finality for uh, blocks, and we use WebAssembly to run data, data algorithms and uh, query languages. And uh, as, a, as a batch, in, in a batch mode, uh, we need batch mode to have the better security on the network because clusters are really small, they work in real time, but they cannot provide very um, like decent level of security on long term. So uh, there is some probability that if on the network we have lots of malicious nodes, uh, some clusters can be, uh, can, can be acquired by, by malicious nodes. So to uh, address these uh, kind of attacks, we have Another role on the network is validation nodes. They have no data, they keep no data, but they constantly, like once per certain period of time, they take a batch of transactions that was performed by a cluster and validate it. And they don't need a copy of data to do this. And uh, 
currently it, it, it works uh, with verification game here, so it do not requires to uh, all the operations to be um, repeated by all the nodes. Just just a few nodes need to repeat operations. Uh, and if we come back to our decentralized uh, to our triangle, uh, real-time component would be somewhere between real-time and cost efficiency, and batch component give us uh, more decentralization. So fluence would be somewhere here. And nobody is ideal, nobody can fill all the triangle so far. Uh, in terms of roles, it's pretty easy. Uh, we have a node on the network. If you like to run a node, you can contribute your storage space, computational power, and your hardware resources to a network, so you can store the data of other people and other participants of the network. If you're a developer, you can either just connect to databases that already on the network, or you can develop your own query language, your own data interface, data API, deployed to the cluster, and then it will be there. You can just work with cluster as a, this traditional database. And uh, users just doing requests. And uh, going back to architecture, like really quickly, so Fluence is a platform, and Fluence core consists of like few few layers. We have we use Kademlia DHT to organize network, and we use Tendermint as a consensus for clusters. We use WebAssembly as a computational engine. Uh, we rely on a on a backups uh, in in a swarm, and we use Ethereum for smart contracts for powering token economy and uh, all the token operations that happens between clients and nodes. And uh, because Fluence is a platform, you as, as a community of developers, you can create, uh, for example, your own implementation of SQL language for Ethereum data, upload it to, to a Fluence network, and other developers will be able to use it. So you can build um, any kind of data APIs on top. And uh, one more picture here. Uh, many things can be uh, built on top. Uh, actually, because we provide the real-time query layer on top of decentralized data, it's possible now to create the like serverless, totally serverless censorship resistant applications. Like for example, you can create decentralized Reddit um, or you can use, you can create and use uh, decentralized indexes for blockchains and use it for wallet apps, for analytic apps, and, and so on. Like you can create a decentralized coin market cap that would not be uh, so, um, like now you know there are few problems with coin market cap. It's very, very significant in the crypto space and if they have some mistakes, intentional or unintentional, uh, they, it's just uh, may become a problem with uh, with uh, cryptocurrency uh, with uh, prices of some some coins, and you even can create the, for example, aggregated order book order books for decentralized exchanges to probably or either match orders or just aggregate orders, process some batch tasks, and so on. And uh, I think. It's all I have today. Uh, feel free to check out our GitHub. Uh, we almost ready with uh, test network. It's probably coming in October. Uh, and uh, we'll be happy to uh, see your, your, your thoughts in our communities. And uh, like I'm open to, to any questions. Cool. Um, one moment. Yeah, hi, um, I'm Bartek. Um, I've got actually two uh, totally unrelated questions. The first one is, uh, you, you said at the beginning that you know the cost of storage in Ethereum is actually really high and no sane person would store a lot of data uh, on blockchain, which is you know essentially true. Uh, but then uh, the architecture that you described looked to me like a cache, some sort of a distributed cache for actually the blockchain data, like, you know, from for Ethereum and, and, and for Bitcoin. So uh, what is it really? I mean, 
I will like distribute the cache for blockchain data so that I can query, you know, my blockchain data efficiently, uh, like the crypto kitties, you know, uh, example that you showed, or you actually provide me with some, you know, uh, different storage options or both. So the, let me, sh let me come back to, yeah, for example, like to, okay, this slide. Uh, yeah, usually, usually uh, you have just like you, for example, there is Infura, right? Infura has Ethereum nodes, and through Infura, Infura nodes have uh, the Ethereum data. And when you connect to Infura node, you have to trust it, and that's the the basic problem is uh, centralization of Ethereum infrastructure. Uh, like, I, I don't don't have exact uh, statistics, but probably about uh, eight to percent of applications that built on top of Ethereum using Infura infrastructure. And that's a pain. So the what Fluence gives here is the decentralization of this like of this infrastructure and the real time query interface. So it is a cache. So it doesn't really solve the problem that it's actually expensive to store data on Ethereum. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. So if you <laughs> we do not make storing data on Ethereum cheaper, right? Not, not on Ethereum, like, you know, maybe outside. Okay, so, so that was my first, you know, question. So the second question is, if you actually cache data from Ethereum and you allow me to, I don't know, uh, do some queries on CryptoKitties, uh, how do you know, uh, I mean, do I need to actually specify somehow in advance that, you know, I am interested in CryptoKitties data and, you know, you will uh, cache, you know, the events from the CryptoKitties contract or, uh, I don't know, any other data or you just store every single contract with every single event and you know and allow me to query virtually anything so uh, just just look at it as a platform so it, it's fully open and uh, potentially anybody can create an index that it, it wants to to use like if you want to create a particular index for crypto kitty application you can do it and deploy it to, to some cluster on the fluence network and uh, we as a, as a fluence team uh, we just we, we would like to start with running uh, Ethereum index, like general Ethereum index on the Fluence network, and we will just leave it open and for anybody to do any custom solutions that they need. Okay, so if I understood correctly, if I wanted to query CryptoKitties data, then I need to first, you know, create some sort of a, I don't know, a transformer or what have you, you know, from the, the blockchain data, like I need to specify events, I probably need to specify ABI for the contract and specify how that data maps to your uh, internal structure, and then I can access it from my DAP, right? Yeah, in general, in general, uh, yes. Uh, and uh, we're just gonna provide few few ready solutions as, as a team, just, we, we are, it's the third thing, we will uh, build the decentralized SQL database and deploy it to Fluence, the general SQL, you can just put anything you want and uh, you use SQL queries to, to access it. And same with Ethereum data. But it's open, you can, if you need, don't need Ethereum, if you need like, I don't know, Monero, you can create a Monero index. Okay, any other questions? Hi. <coughs> what are validation nodes? You've told there are validation nodes. What what do they do? Yeah, let me come back to this slide. So, uh, the the idea of validation nodes is to verify the correctness of operations that was done by by a cluster. And uh, actually, they like you can validate the operation. Like we use it's it's a little bit. Um, can be done differently. Like in general, for example, uh, if you have a Merkleized structure on your database and uh, you have a root hash of your database on a blockchain on some external storage, for example, it's, it's Swarm or Ethereum, and uh, you have a log of request response with Merkle proof. So now you just need uh, to, like you don't need data to validate this, uh, that this response was uh, correct. You just take request, you take response with Merkle proof, and you take a root hash of a database, and you can validate this. So they are doing these kinds of validation. 
and this can be done just by a random node on the network. It don't require to keep or like full copy of, of a database on these nodes. Okay, but also the Bitcoin data also available from the Luyens, right? Like it, it not yet. Like so, we designed the network to be, uh, yeah, to to any kinds of data to be available. Okay, are you going? Are you planning to create insert queries so you can push data to blockchains? No, it just it, it just yeah, if you're talking about like indexing blockchain, it's about reading data because to to push data to a blockchain, you have lots of uh, tools. Thank you. Okay. I think that, ah, one more, good. First question, uh, my name is Adrian. Uh, first question is, uh, what is current status of your project? Is it just an idea or something that is working or some mockups or POC? Yeah, uh, we started a year ago from concept of building decentralized database. Uh, this spring, about February, we released the decentralized um, key value database with, with the browser JavaScript client. Uh, and then we just did a little bit uh, pivot to more platform vision. And then we just, for, for a couple of months, we reworked the, the code. Uh, and now you can um, check out the, the code on, on our GitHub. Uh, it's almost, uh, like, it's almost complete. For now, you can see like lots of activity that happen in issues and, and all, all the uh, things. So we expect to have our first uh, test network that you can play with uh, like about October, probably end of October, something like that. Okay. okay, thank you. And second question, are you focusing most on no SQL databases or uh, SQL relational databases will be also available? And if yes, uh, do you think that you have an, an idea how to cluster all that databases that are distributed between uh, different nodes? Well, it's uh, still to be determined exactly like the, these kind of things. Uh, I cannot say uh, exactly for now. Uh, the if we're talking about uh, like lots of like high data volumes, for example, if we need to put like a few terabytes of data. Uh, we just want to implement it as a basic sharding, so actually you split your data set on two parts and you put one part on one cluster and second part on second cluster. But if you would like to uh, perform the aggregated query across two to these parts, uh, it should be done, like you, you should do one part here, one part here, and aggregate on the client anyway. Thank you. Okay, I think for the next questions, I would gr just uh, catch uh, Yevgeny doing the networking part. Uh, we'll proceed now to the second talk. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Make some noise. This is mine? Yeah, this is mine. Okay, cool. All right, hi everyone. I'm Jack uh, from Parity Technologies, based in Berlin. Um, how okay? I don't really know what the sort of technical level as far as blockchains go of the room is. Like, hands up if you run your own like blockchain client of any kind, like Ethereum, Bitcoin. Okay, cool. Uh, hands up if you've written a blockchain client of any kind, like even like a proof of concept. Absolutely no one. Okay, cool. <laughs> um, so if you have written a blockchain client, and even if you haven't, something that you should probably know is that blockchains are kind of terrible. Um, using them is terrible and, and, and writing them is terrible. Uh, obviously, I think like most of us would say that the benefits outweigh the drawbacks, but uh, it's worth working on the drawbacks. So uh, I'd say the first problem with most blockchains nowadays is that they are incredibly slow. Um, like just, just block times are, are normally very, very long and then uh, the, the waiting for the number of confirmations is even longer, um, and it's quite it's not it's not great for users, and it also like reduces the throughput, which reduces the amount that you can use it for uh, automated stuff. Um, horribly inefficient as well, which is like a, a separate problem to slow. So um, 
not only not only is it, it does it take a long time like for you, but also like if you look at it from the scale of us as a species, we're using horrendous amounts of power and horrendous amounts of computation time to do what is essentially like um, adding and subtracting numbers from uh, addresses, which is just ridiculous. Uh, you, with most uh, blockchains nowadays, you can't be 100% sure that a block will never be reverted. Um, if this, this isn't normally like a problem if you know you're connected to like the network as a whole, but it could be that you're on like some small subset of the network and then when you become attached to the main network, then suddenly you have all these blocks and like all of the state that you've seen is completely invalidated. Uh, and there's not really any way to defend against this at all um, with current blockchains. Um, it's, it, there's no upgrading. You can't upgrade a blockchain, uh, at least a, a traditional blockchain. Um, the, you, you can, you, uh, blockchains are like copy on write, essentially. Like if you, if you wanna, if you wanna upgrade, upgrade a blockchain, you just create a new blockchain that has all the same state as the old one. Um, we, 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 the only thing that makes it an upgrade is that we all agree to call the new blockchain by the same name, uh, kind of like when your dog dies and you get a new dog and you just call it the same name so your kids don't notice. Um, it's really hard to build. It's really hard to build um, blockchains uh, and the fact that no one here put their hand up kind of shows why, well, it, it kind of uh, is, is proof of this. Um, I work for a company that builds blockchains and I've never built a blockchain from scratch. Like I've never designed and built my own one because doing so is, is a mammoth task. It's, it's, there's, there's so much you need to know. You need to uh, have pretty in-depth knowledge of like networking, uh, economics, cryptography, um, performance stuff. Uh, and I, th I think like the number of people who, who, who know about all of these to the kind of level that they could build a blockchain that's actually production grade uh, could be could fit in this room. Um, and kind of related to this, it's, it's pretty hard to, to, to make, to, to, to innovate on this. Um, because it's hard to upgrade, and so people generally don't, the pace of development is slow, and it's really hard for just some random person to like go in their room on the weekend and hack away, build their own like new blockchain that does something super cool and, and new. Um, and so as a result, the pace of development, I mean, the, the blockchains that we use now basically do the same thing as Bitcoin most of the time. Uh, they, they have a lot of, they have extra features and stuff, but there's not really a, uh, they're not that meaningfully different to how they were uh, almost a decade ago. Um, and yeah, you, there's not really like a, this base that you can build off. Um, the, a, lot of, a lot of teams, when they build a new blockchain, they just fork off an existing code base. But that's not really the same as like having abstractable libraries, um, because if, if you, if the original team continues working on their blockchain, the only way you can get their work is by like rebasing on their code, um, which is you don't you don't want to do because you'll get merge conflicts. They, there's no like defined bind boundary between what they can change and what they can't change. Um, it's not we don't really have like these set of like uh, independent libraries that all work together. We just have like a big blob that everyone hacks on. Um, they're, they're all built as a monolith basically, and. Uh, the terminology for like first generation, second generation blockchains is kind of iffy, kind of murky. But I, I would say first generation is basic accounting, stuff like Bitcoin. Uh, technically, that's a smart contract platform, but no one uses it. Um, stuff like Zcash, stuff like Monero, where they basically just move numbers around. And then the second generation, I would say, is stuff like Ethereum um, and very few others that have like smart contracts. But, um, yeah. Uh, we, most blockchains are still first generation, like building a smart contract platform sucks. Um, it's, it's very, there's, there, there's so much stuff that you need to do and like very few people are willing to go through all of that work just to then have to compete against Ethereum, which has so much mindshare, even though uh, it's kind of terrible. And I say that as a guy who uses it every single day at work. Um, so Parity Substrate, our product is, 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 built to fix most of these problems. Well, all, all of these problems, there are, there are other problems with blockchains, but I didn't tell you about them so that our product looks better. Uh, so by default, it's fast. There are fast proof of work chains. Um, I'm gonna get into exactly what the difference is there uh, in a bit. 
And there are faster proof of work chains like Ethereum, but by default, proof of work chains are like slow. You need to do quite a lot of tweaking in order to make it fast. But if you if you're building a, a chain with substrate is by default fast. I'll get into exactly um, why this is in a second. Um, and also efficient. So again, I'll get into exactly how that works in a second. Um, I could have an entire other talk about the sort of mechanism that we use to have these two, but I'm going to blast through it and hope that you guys uh, get the gist. Um, so unlike in, in, in chains that use the, it's, it's called the longest chain rule, um, basically in something like Bitcoin and something like Ethereum, you can never be 100% sure that any given block will not be reverted. Um, you can only be 99.99999% sure, which is, which is pretty good, um, of course, but um, it's, it, it still introduces like a level of, of uncertainty. With substrate chains, obviously, substrate is not the only one that allows this, but with if you build on substrate by default, you get uh, predictable finality. You know exactly when a block will be 100% certain instead of having to sort of guess it through economic incentives with this kind of wishy-washy back of the napkin logic. Um, and it is total, so it is 100%. This block cannot be reverted, and, and this is without sacrificing the security. Um, so I'm gonna get into this in a second, um, and this is the, the thing that I'm excited about, personally. Uh, th so this, th you, can, you can actually upgrade a substrate chain. Um, which is which is rare, and in fact, uh, I believe that uh, Polkadot, which is our product that sub is built on Substrate, was the first governance-based on-chain upgrade of a blockchain in history. Uh, we we've yet to find another example of this, so this is like a very new thing. Um, so yeah, but essentially, you don't need to hard fork, um, and I'll get into exactly how that works. Um, so, if you're just building a simple chain, because we because number one. Uh, substrate, the whole library abstracts away a lot, but also because it's like a, a, a base that you can uh, build libraries on, which is another one of the points on here, spoilers. Uh, you, you, can, you can like hack stuff together very, very quickly. Uh, we've got this substrate demo, which is like a test net for substrate, um, and it's very confusingly also called substrate internally. Um, I don't know who made that decision, but uh, I'm, I'm not gonna call them a moron just in case I know them personally. Uh, but yeah, so it, 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 you could build a simple chain that does something not super exciting and new in a weekend, which is which is not true nowadays. Um, and so, because it's like a library with a very well-defined boundary um, and very well-defined API, we can do a bunch of extra stuff on Substrate. We can change it and um, we can iterate on it independent of your code and independent of like some other project that it needs to have backwards compatibility. Like if you're building on the Bitcoin code base, they will iterate and break your code and it's not really independent. They have to maintain backwards compatibility with their own chain. Um, but we work on Substrate and Polkadot, which is the like the, 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 the flagship Substrate chain, like completely separately. And uh, we pin Polkadot to a particular Substrate chain. So it, we can update Substrate and do like loads of extra stuff without uh, having to worry about like keeping backwards compatibility for something like Polkadot. Um, and yeah, so you can build, and because it's got such well-defined APIs and we've got these various abstractions, which I'm not gonna talk about here, uh, it's very easy to build libraries that just integrate easily with Substrate. Uh, that means that if you are building a chain, you can pull in other people's work very, very quickly and easily. Uh, and we've built a bunch of these libraries already. Actually, Polkadot um, has precisely one library in the Polkadot repo. Everything else is just like uh, an abstract library that could work with any substrate chain. And that, and that one is the Clara chain. I mean, uh, okay, who knows what Polkadot is at all? Okay, so this is a fair number. I feel like I can use it as an example then. Okay, that's fine. Um, and I'm not gonna get into this, I'm sorry, but uh, it, it makes it a lot easier to build smart contract stuff. We have a smart contract library that is off the shelf, um, but also we have like a gassable, secure, deterministic uh, virtual machine built into Substrate, which is actually like a component of some of the other stuff that we do um, anyway. So it's quite easy to build a smart contract platform in a way that is not really possible if you're building a chain any other way 
uh, apart from forking Ethereum, I guess. Um, which people do do, actually. I know one chain is forked from Ethereum. I don't know what else is. Um, so the, 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 the speed and efficiency comes from proof of authority consensus. Uh, so at the moment, most chains, pretty much all chains, are proof of work. Does anyone know what proof of authority is? Like, how much do I need to? Do I, I can have like a quick run through of what it is. I see two hands, three hands, a few hands. Okay. Did you know? Do you know what proof of authority is compared to proof of work? Yeah. Yeah, that's not many. So, uh, proof of work essentially everyone is racing to create a new block. Uh, you but, and and to prove that you have some amount of real world computation power, you. Um, to do like a certain amount of work for that block to be considered valid. But like everyone's ru rushing to do this at the same time. Uh, proof, uh, yeah, uh, proof of authority is a uh, thing where you have a, a certain, for each block, you have a given set of like some number of nodes which are allowed to create a block, uh, sorry, which are allowed to validate a block, and then only one of them is allowed to create that block. Um, and normally this is used for sort of um, like uh, private private chains. So if, say you've got like a something like Swift, where you've got like f several banks communicating with each other. All those banks would be authorities, so they don't have to trust any given party. Like in the same way that banks trust Swift, they only have to trust that all of the banks aren't colluding. Um, but actually, uh, as I'll get to, you can do more with it than just private chains. You can also do permissionless chains, um, similar to what proof of work chains are. So yeah, proof of authority is extremely efficient because you're not racing. You're essentially doing only the work needed to actually create a given block. You're not doing, so say that, say you have 10 miners on a chain, which is like extremely small for a proof of work chain. Um, that, that's already, even without caring about like the, doing the useless work to prove the security, you're already doing 10 times the amount of work um, over, the, over the whole network in order to create this given block. Uh, with proof of authority, because only one person can create any given block, uh, you're only doing the work necessary to create that block. Uh, and also, you do not have to um, do any useless work on top of that, because the, the thing that you're proving is that you uh, are a certain person. You know, it's like a, you get punished for failing instead of uh, rewarded for, with a block reward for being the first one to win the race. Um, and also, proof of authority, because each given block has a certain given set of people who are allowed to validate it. Uh, this means that once two thirds of those people have validated it, um, I'm not going to explain the two thirds number, just take my word for it. Uh, once two thirds of those people have validated it, then you know that it can't be reverted because that given block is, uh, could only ever be validated by those people. So the way that like validation, like the way that, you, that, that people vouch for a block in proof of work is that they build another block on top of it. and so therefore, because anyone can create a block over the course of the whole chain, there's, there's an infinite set of people who could theoretically validate a given block, who could theoretically vouch for a given block. Uh, and as a result, this means that you can't say, well, when two thirds of the people who could validate this block validate it, then it can never be reverted because two thirds of infinity is still infinity. There's no, there's no bar that you could put there that would uh, make that okay. Um, as with proof of authority, you can do that. And yeah, so as I said, this is like you could, traditionally proof of authority consensus is for private chains, um, for people, yeah, like banks, and uh, we're using it for uh, the the World Food Program and like these sort of more centralized, semi-centralized chains. You can call them federated, um, but because the set of authorities is per block, not per chain. You can change the set of authorities every block or every 10 blocks or every 100 blocks, for example. And you could choose those authorities based on who's staking, and then that's proof of stake, which is a completely permissionless, as decentralized as proof of work is kind of consensus. And it's just built on this base of proof of authority. Um, do I need to explain proof of stake quickly? Does everyone know what proof of stake is? Hands up if you know what proof of stake is. Okay, fantastic, okay. I'm sorry for the people who don't, you can ask me about it later. Um, so, what is Substrate? What, what does it mean to build a blockchain with Substrate? So, 
in Substrate, we have this concept of like a, a blockchain's runtime. So, uh, uh, sorry. Uh, you, a blockchain is many things. It, it's this sort of decentralized computation, this method of sharing blocks with everyone, this method of sharing data with everyone in this, in this uh, trustless way. But like a blockchain has to do something um, and for example, with Bitcoin, Zcash, Monero, uh, and other chains like that, um, that thing that they're doing is, is essentially like accounting. And with Ethereum, it's accounting plus smart contracts. Like, that's the, the actual useful computation for, for, for us that it's doing. If, if we were building it as a centralized system, that would be what we're doing. And the runtime is this, basically. It's um, the thing that the blockchain actually does when you strip away all the blockchain. Um, and in Substrate, uh, this, this seems like it should be quite a simple thing, but like the runtime, the thing that the blockchain does is, is completely separated. Like you could run like a, you could have like a Substrate, we have like different consensus modes. So you can have a consensus mode that just runs it as a centralized thing. Uh, and then it's essentially just like a, a centralized system. I don't know if that makes any sense. Forget I said it. Uh, <laughs> so, so like the thing that the blockchain does has to be completely separated from the, communication, from the consensus, from all of this. Um, essentially, all the blockchain can do, so all the runtime can do is add a single transaction to a block, like handle a single transaction, uh, choose the authorities, and choose its own code, uh, which might sound kind of abstract, but we'll get to exactly what this enables. Uh, yeah, we actually can't, we can't let it do more than that, because if you give it too much power, then, uh, no, I'll talk about that in the next bit. <laughs> uh, yeah, and this is like extremely powerful, even though it seems very simple, and I'll get, and I'll get to exactly why it's so powerful in the next frame. Uh, so yeah, this, uh, this, this runtime has to be separated from everything else, and we, well, so Substrate is written with Rust. Rust is the only language of first class support in Substrate right now. There's nothing stopping you from writing a wrapper to build it in something else, but you'd be real redoing a lot of work. So let's just pretend that Substrate is Rust only for now. Um, we can compile just the runtime. We can separate it out and compile it to WebAssembly, which is uh, essentially a virtual machine. So in the same way that you can like distribute like the PyC files, no. Nah. Mm. Essentially you can, you can uh, 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 compile it to like a assembly format which, which works across many different computers and is sandboxed and ca can be uh, distributed on the blockchain without worrying about security, basically. That's the important bit here. Um, so because the runtime is distributed on the blockchain itself and chosen on by on-chain governance, uh, if you don't have the latest client version, so like if you want to upgrade Ethereum, you have to upgrade the, block, the client way beforehand, and then you just have like this little if statement that just says when you get to this certain point, turn it turn into new new Ethereum. Um, you don't do that with with a substrate chain. Uh, you, if you don't have the latest version, uh, you 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 still have the runtime deployed on the blockchain. You can switch to running that in the virtual machine, and that means that you still know what the blockchain should be doing. Maybe you don't get the upgrades to the networking stack or something, but we use this extensible networking stack, so uh, that's just the same as backwards compatibility in any distributed system. Um, so essentially, if you run a, a node, you never need to upgrade it. Uh, you probably want to, but you you never need to, uh, and that's really important. Like all of, we don't have we don't we don't leave any nodes behind. Um, and. So even though it's in a virtual machine, this doesn't necessarily mean it's slow. You can, we can just detect whether or not the code's changed, and if you do have the latest client, then we just compile a native version of the code into that client, and then we just run that. Uh, works exactly the same as it would if you were running a, a contemporary client, you know? Uh, you, only, you only use the VM if your client is not up to date. And because the runtime chooses its own code, this means that the on-chain governance can decide on code upgrades. And this is, that, this is like working today. As I said, um, Polkadot upgraded from proof of concept one to proof of concept two. 
uh, with on-chain governance, we had like we have like a UI where you can vote on code changes, and uh, it, the first governance uh, failed. I guess uh, like uh, they voted not to upgrade. Uh, I guess because someone is a test net, so anyone can take as many coins as they like. So I guess like someone was just playing a prank, but eventually it did work. Second time lucky. Uh, and as far as we know, like there's never been a governance-based on-chain upgrade before. Um, so this is the first time. And yeah, upgrading uh, in lockstep without having to hard fork ever again. Amazing. Uh, so yeah, like clients. This isn't. This is a lot more familiar. That last one, I, I probably should have uh, front loaded the less impressive one, but the more impressive one second. Uh, so yeah, like clients. Uh, they essentially are nodes that don't run the whole code. They're still trustless, but they only val validate the headers. They don't like go through and recreate the state of the blockchain. They just like trust that the state of the blockchain is correct, um, which sounds like trusting. It's, act it's actually not trusting. They only have to trust that the whole network is correct, not that any given node is correct, even though they're only getting state from the node. We have, we have like an entire talk on, on light clients, like it's quite a complex subject, so I'm not gonna go exactly into how it all works. Uh, so, first thing, you can run a light client like in a browser, basically. You don't have to have these hosted wallets. Uh, well, you can have something that looks like a hosted wallet to a regular person. Uh, you can just go to polkadot.network and then have it look like a hosted wallet, but actually it's running entirely on your front end. That doesn't work now, by the way. Don't don't pretend that I promise that that works now. Um, so this basically has three components. The most important one, and uh, this is something that allows us to do a similar thing for Ethereum, although nowhere near as powerful, uh, is that our networking stack works in TCP and WebSockets transparently. WebSockets is... Blame Arch Linux. Something to entertain you, but I'm not interesting or fun. Okay, we're back, sorry. Uh, and so, yeah, uh, because we can, we already have to compile it for WebAssembly, that means we can just run it in the browser, uh, the runtime, uh, which means that we can basically assume 
the, the, that you have to be, that we can assume that your runtime works in the browser. Uh, this means that we can basically give you a light client for free. Um, it's not quite for free because every blockchain stores its state differently, and so you need to handle it differently. But like the light client bit of the light client, that's for free. So you don't need to do that much. You just need to make sure that you can handle like the transaction format and the state format. Um, and yeah, so you can have essentially what is a hosted wallet, but without having to trust anyone, uh, which is great because I don't trust anyone. Um, so as a, as, as, a, as a footnote to this, um, not only do you get a light client, but you can run a light client uh, forever. As I said, you can have a long running node uh, because of the for free upgrades. So this means that if you want to like have a fridge that runs uh, a light client and tells you tells you how much balance you have in your Ethereum account. I don't know why you don't want that in your fridge, but you get the point. Like you don't need to have to ha have some off-chain upgrade mechanism that requires you to trust someone. You're basically having trustless upgrades. I mean, if you've ever owned any Internet of Things device, you can know that Internet of Things manufacturers are not trusted to update any of their stuff ever. Um, and God forbid that they try to make something that updates often enough to keep up with something like Ethereum. Um, it's, it's not happening. But with this, uh, in a, in a, in a trust-free or less trusting way, you can still keep up to date on a long-running light client and uh, yeah, not have to trust Sony or whatever, I don't know. Um, so it looks like people generally know what Polkadot is. Um, we supply a pretty good upgrade path. We will supply, apply a pretty good upgrade path. Uh, from Substrate to Polkadot. So a lot of this stuff works already, but this, this is, this is uh, future stuff, mostly. So if you're making something on, on Substrate, probably you, s you satisfy everything that you need to migrate to Polkadot. There's like a certain set of things that you must be able to do, and it's basically the same things as the, what a Substrate runtime has to do. So you're already separated out enough to be able to uh, build a parachain. Um, but not only that, but we want to have like a substrate consensus mode, which is basically like a backend for the runtime. Uh, it's a little bit more complicated than that. But essentially, you should be able to take a substrate chain, press like one big red button that says Polkadotify, and it should just work as a parachain, um, which is really good for us, because it means we can run Polkadot as a Polkadot parachain, um, which you'd think is dumb, and no one would want to do that. But actually, it's very smart, and everyone wants to do it. Because it means we can run like a test net as a parachain, and we can have our test net like still have the said shared security of Polkadot without having to do what we currently do for our Covan test net and have to like ask a bunch of people to run Covan nodes to keep the network correct, um, which is dumb and bad. Uh, and this is uh, smart and good. Um, so this is the last thing I'm going to talk about. Uh, substrate and blockchains are not just cryptocurrency. I mean, everyone, everyone now thinks, you hear blockchain and you think cryptocurrency, but uh, there we go. So a blockchain is, is essentially just like, if you've ever done event sourcing, or if you've ever done reactive programming, or if you've only done ever this stuff, then a blockchain is just that from a programming model perspective. I mean, if you can build it in Redux, like the, the JavaScript front-end framework, if you can build it in some kind of reactive programming framework, then you can build it as a blockchain. And at the moment, no one would ever want to because blockchains are horribly efficient, uh, inefficient and bad. But if you have an efficient and good uh, blockchain creation framework that allows you to actually upgrade and, and basically fixes a lot of the worst uh, hangups with building stuff as blockchains, then you can like uh, build a lot more. You don't have to build a cryptocurrency. You could build a social network, for example, you can imagine something like Mastodon, where like the admins of any given like instance are the authority nodes, and so it doesn't matter that they have censorship abilities. So like if you have a proof of authority chain with fixed authorities and the authorities have censorship abilities, um, it doesn't matter that they'd have that because that's the entire like that that that's good. That's what you want. Um, you could build like an instant messenger. It wouldn't be a super instant messenger, but it would be an instant-ish messenger. Um, that would be completely decentralized, you could have privacy, um, and it would be like, maybe you'd receive messages in a couple of seconds, 
which is not like the best ever, but it's like not that bad. Uh, and of course, you could build a market. And instead of, so say like something like Open Bazaar, that's a market built on the smart contract platform of another cryptocurrency, because that's the only real useful way to use that, to use a certain cryptocurrency is to build your market on that cryptocurrency. But with Substrate, you could have like a decentralized market that uses a different currency, like uses an external currency. So you could use a currency that isn't terrible. Like, I mean, essentially, this is like a, you could have a smart contract platform for a currency without smart contracts. You could communicate using Polkadot to, with this other chain and then do all the actual computation on your own personal substrate chain. Um, and thank you. That's all I've got to say today. Okay, questions. I see already two. Oh, yeah, I'm not choosing. Uh, again, two questions. Um, is the uh, proof of authority consensus uh, algo uh, aura the same one that's used in Colvin, or is it just something different? So yeah, it's it's uh, actually it's a uh, combined one. So it's this PBFT slash aura hybrid. Um, I'm not 100 percent sure about how. Aura works right now, but I think it, I think it you need like I think you can't build a block until a block is finalized. That's certainly how Tendermint works right now. I think, uh, whereas this like basically use the longest chain rule like temporarily, and then when a block is finalized, then we uh, build on top of that afterwards. So it means you sort of can start building new blocks very fast while the previous block is being finalized. Uh, we actually have like a bunch of resources to say exactly how it works, but um, we don't have an actual name for it uh, right now. Okay, and but so it, it is aura based, yeah. It's aura based. And uh, speaking of Tendermint, uh, how this uh, architecture actually compares to Cosmos SDK? Because you said that you know there's nothing like that, but you know it seems like there are a lot of uh, similarities, right? Yes, it absolu uh, yes, absolutely. So I think that like uh, Substrate and Tendermint are two ways of achieving very similar goals. They're both ways of like. Um, Tendermint, like the things that I had at the start, the big list of things that Substrate solves, Tendermint solves all of them apart from the upgrade mechanism, uh, and, but they do allow you a lot more flexibility. As I said, like Rust is the only first class supported language um, for Substrate. Um, whereas for Tendermint, there's really no reason you couldn't use anything that you want. Um, in the language, yeah, because you've got the uh, ACBI, right? So Exactly, exactly, yeah. In any language. Um, but that's not really feasible with Substrate. I mean, even if you wanted to use a language other than Rust, it would have to be a compiled to WebAssembly language. So like, you you get this like fork free upgrades, which I personally think is like the most exciting thing about Substrate, but you don't get the same freedom that Tendermint provides. I mean, I, I, I have a lot of respect for the Cosmos team. I think that they're doing like a lot of good work and um, uh, Polkadot and Cosmos are basically solving similar pro uh, uh, problems in different ways, and the same is true of Tendermint and Substrate. We're solving similar problems in different ways. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, I'm Martin. Uh, one thing, this Magipore one looks like a templating uh, attack vector. So good okay. luck. So, so that again? Uh, this Magic Power one uh, looks like a very templating attack vector. So yes, good sorry. luck with securing it. Yep. And the question is, uh, how do you position Polkadot and Substrate against Hyperledger? Um, so I, I, know, I only know that Hyperledger is a blockchain into a, a communication framework. Is that true? Right. Yeah. Is, it, is it just for tokens? It's I think it's a platform. Right, but it, um, is it the same where it has like parachains that have shared security? I don't think oh, so, right? Sure. Yeah. OK, this guy's shaking his head. I trust him. He has, he has a ponytail. Um, <laughs> but. Uh, the, so uh, yeah, I, but I think that like Hyperledger doesn't doesn't supply anything like Substrate. Uh, is that true? Yeah. Yeah. But it, it, is that yes? It doesn't, or yes, it does. Yes, it doesn't. <laughs> yes. Okay. Yeah. So um, Polkadot and Substrate. There's like there's sorry po Polkadot and Hyperledger. There's many things Polkadot solves. Uh, the Hyperledger does not, but um, because of Hyperledger's more laser focus on like being a decentralized exchange, I believe is more. It's no, it's not its use case. No. Okay. I was. Uh, I, I, I don't really know much about Hyperledger. Like I, I have whispers on the breeze of like things that I've heard about it. So, huh? It's what? not. Oh, is there going to be a fight? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so. Hyperledger is a platform to build a blockchain. So, how do you position? Oh, okay. 
I don't know. Okay. What kind of market do you thing. aim to? Um, so yeah, so substrate. The, obviously, there's nothing saying that you have to build it on substrate, but I don't think that there's anything that supplies the same, um, like fork free upgrades and ability to plug things together like like lego bricks that substrate does i don't think there's anything that really like hits that same niche uh, but at the same time i'm sure there's plenty of the hyperledger does that substrate does not but as as i've clearly shown i don't i don't know what the fuck i'm talking about uh, okay. well, as, uh with regards to, i can talk about the attack vector one cuz i'm actually very interested in this i've been talk i've been having uh, a lot of talks with my colleagues about this exact thing um, upgrades as an attack vector so Although currently, like our implementation of Polkadot's substrate runtime, you can only change the whole runtime or none of the runtime. There's nothing stopping you from saying, like, I don't know, you can tweak values with the governance, but the rest of it's set in stone, or you can change the way it behaves, but you can't change the governance, so that means you could, like, have the governance go back on a previously, uh, on, a, on, a, on a fork that they didn't actually like, on a change they didn't like. Um, and in order to make, in order to do these these upgrades, you would need to have control over the government, um, which like the the entire point of of, of building an on chain governance system is to prevent like any one party from having control over the government. And like obviously that's not really a super solved problem right now. We basically just implement coin voting in Polkadot, but we want to change that by the time it's released. Um, so yes, it's an attack vector but no more than like anything, <laughs> like no more than anything could be an attack vector in a blockchain if you control more than half the network. Um, yeah, and you, you can mi mitigate it if you like by only allowing things to be changed that you feel are safe to be changed. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if that helps. Thank you. Hi, you have told that there is a process or a procedure if a chain can become a power chain. Can you describe in a few words if, for example, someone has his own tweaked Ethereum with his own Genesis block chain, what has he fulfilled to become a power chain? So if you have a blockchain like Ethereum, how would you become a power chain? Like if you have a blockchain that is not necessarily built on substrate, is that what you mean? Yeah. Yes. So um, essentially you need like this, this uh, if it's a blockchain without without total finality, like an Ethereum-based chain would not have total finality, uh, you need to have what's called a finality finality gadget, or uh, I've heard people someone say finality widget, but I don't know whether they just misspoke. Uh, <laughs> like, essentially, you need to like pretend to have finality on top of that. So you need to have like, you can imagine it as like a mini substrate chain that just connects that, that you would run that in the same process as an Ethereum node or, or your chain's node. Uh, and then when you get to a certain uh, chain length, then you can just pretend that blocks older than that are finalized. And then you report the finalized blocks to Polkadot itself. Um, it's a little bit more complicated than that. But essentially, that's the thing. I mean, really, the only thing that you absolutely need to uh, have in order to be on Polkadot as a parachain is total finality. Um, there's, there's really nothing else you absolutely need. Um, and we are actually in the process of building a bridge for Ethereum that it does this, which has this finality overlay on top of Ethereum. Um, as far as like what the actual nuts and bolts of like how would you go out tomorrow and write the code that actually does it, uh, I can't help you because I personally don't know. Um, sorry. But is it is it true if someone spawns his own blockchain, Ethereum blockchain, mm -hmm. it almost out of the box can become a power chain? Uh, no, 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 no. If it's if it's if it's not a substrate chain, it cannot become a block, a power chain out of the box. You'd need to write like a, a connective layer um, that 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 actually pretends that Ethereum has finality. Don't you think it would be a nice feature to to create some kind of a automate process so every Ethereum-based blockchain become they're really one click, one script, it becomes a yeah. power chain. Yes, that would be very nice. But I don't think there's enough Ethereum based blockchains for that to be that useful for us. We we are building people could build their own blockchains based on yes. just for the Ethereum, make his own Genesis block True. infrastructure and go. And it would be quite easy for you to um, so we we are, we are already building a bridge for Ethereum. So if you're building an Ethereum based blockchain, um, because if it's Ethereum based, like 
we don't know what you have and haven't changed really, so there's not that much we can do to abstract over it. But because we have a bridge for Ethereum, it should be pretty easy for you to just take that bridge and just apply it to your own chain with whatever tweaks you know that you've made to Ethereum itself, you know? Um, unlike Substrate, Ethereum-based chains don't have this strict separation between like the stuff you can abstract over and the, the stuff that the chain actually does. So it's, it's, it's a lot harder for us to make like a generic finality uh, gadget that works across all Ethereum-based chains. But for sure, you could probably take our Ethereum bridge and make very small tweaks to it and just make it work with your bridge. What is the difference between the bridge and being like using the bridge and Polkadot and, use, and being a substrate chain yeah. in, within the Polkadot? So the bridge would be a substrate chain, if that makes sense. So the, the, the bridge, like a, a bridge is just a chain that reports data from an external chain like a chain that is not directly connected to Polkadot. So like, I mean, bridge is really just like a, it's, it's, it's a social term, you know, there's nothing like that. Like Polkadot doesn't know what the difference is between a bridge and a parachain. Um, it's, it's, all, it's all parachains to, to Polkadot. But uh, a, a bridge just reports data from something like Ethereum, from something like Bitcoin, which cannot connect directly to Polkadot because they don't satisfy the finality constraints. Thank you. Okay, I think we will have one more question. Yeah, short question, I hope. Um, speak all the time about finality, but all this finality is under some assumption of numbers of uh, malicious uh, authority nodes, right? Which is like uh, one third? Yes, it's, um, yeah, it, it, it one third of colluding malicious authority nodes, not one third of malicious authority nodes. Okay, yeah, um, so what happens, do you have any recovery option for the case that you do have a fork? Um, so I, I might be wrong, but you can't fork like in the traditional sense. You can, with our particular implementation, you could like have a short fork, so like you could fork, uh, but that fork would only be a, be a maximum of like four blocks deep, and then the chain would grind to a halt, basically. So uh, like really, the main thing that malicious authorities can do um, if they control more than a third of the network is, is shut down the network or censor uh, reports of their own, mis mis uh, their own misdeeds. Like uh, if, if, if so, for example, there's things that the authorities shouldn't do, like um, they shouldn't sign on two blocks of the same height and if someone has found out that someone's done that, they support like this, they, they, they supply a sort of proof that they've done this to the chain. And if authorities control, if, if, if colluding malicious authorities control more than a third of the chain, uh, more than two thirds of the chain, they could censor that. And if they control more than one third of the chain, they can just like refuse to shut, refuse to um, validate any blocks. And that would essentially grind the chain to a halt. Um, there's. They, they, they can't do arbitrarily bad things, really. Um, if you control more than two-thirds of the government, government or whatever your majority level is for that particular government, you could do a lot worse things, depending on what the government's powers are. But like, just as far as like, the number of authorities, you would need to have quite a few. You, you can't just do arbitrarily bad things. You can basically just shut down the network or censor reports of uh, misdeeds. I don't know if that, that's helpful. Oh, also, I should say, in a proof of stake system, because the authorities are weighted, randomly chosen, um, it's it, you'd have to control like more than two thirds of the stake in the entire system, and also get extremely lucky, and you'd only be able to shut it down for one like era. We call it like one uh, period where you have a certain number, a certain set of authorities. So it's like it, in a proof of authority system like you would already have like quite a high bar, but then a proof of stake system, it's even harder to get to that bar. I don't know if, that, I don't know if that's helpful. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. And there will be one more short announcement. Yeah, make some noise. Thank you, Mr. Jack. <laughs>